Hey everybody, back to basics number 42. Today we're going to talk about tithing. Uh, it's a beautiful day in Georgia, high in the 70s, back out on my front porch, which I love. And my brother lives in Colorado Springs and they're expecting a huge snowstorm this weekend. My dad's actually there with him. Two to three feet of snow they might get in Colorado Springs, but it is absolutely beautiful here in Georgia on my front porch. I want to talk to you today about tithing. You know, as we as we deal with this back to basics, we're now at the top of the house where it's what are we to do? Uh, uh, again, always flowing out of intimacy with God, relationship with God, knowing who He is, what Jesus did for us, who we are in Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now we're expressing that, we're living that out. And one of the important areas of living it out is in our money. Jesus said that you cannot serve both God and money. Jesus said that it's harder for a rich man to get to heaven. Um, I mean, I mean uh, it's, it's, it's hard for a rich man to get to heaven, easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to go to heaven. And uh, the rich young ruler, he said, go and sell all you possess. He wasn't willing. He forfeited following Jesus and eternal life because of money and how money has been such a downfall for many people. And so one of the ways to keep the grip of materialism off of us, one of the ways to obey God in an area where you can know for sure that you've been obedient, one of the ways to live a life of generosity, one of the ways to lay up treasures in heaven, one of the ways to demonstrate that Jesus is Lord of your money and possessions. One of those ways, it's not the end, it's the beginning. It's the floor, not the ceiling of, of giving, is tithing. Tithing is giving, returning. I almost, almost said the word, giving. It's returning to God the first 10% because he tells us to do that, and it's a way to trust him and put our faith into practical application. I love this, frankly. Uh, I practiced this uh, since uh, the early days of my walk with God, again, because I was discipled by somebody, and I began to do this even with my allowance money. I actually did this before I got saved, but then once I got saved, little odd jobs here and there, practiced this, always have, always will. Now it's more than 10%. 10% uh, is the beginning, and then you give above that. And it's so exciting to trust God. I had a guy in Wisconsin, Brian Tippett, if you're watching. I'll, I'll never forget what you said. You said, you know, tithing is one of those areas of, of the Bible that I love because I know for sure whether I've done it or not. He said, sometimes areas like loving God with all your heart, uh, loving your neighbors yourself, do I really ever know, feel like I've done that? It's kind of subjective. But tithing is so objective. 10%. I know I've done it, I can check it off, and again, not that it be treated that way, but it's like I can kind of, man, you know, I got that one done, at least I did that one. <laughs> and again, it shouldn't be done in that spirit, but there's a good point there. All right, turn to Malachi 3, then we'll go to Proverbs 3, then we'll go to Matthew 23, and then we'll go to 1 Corinthians 16. One of the biggest questions people always ask is, is this supported in the New Testament? Well, we'll get there. Jesus actually supported it. So in, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, will a man rob God? Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. I'm reading out of the NIV today. Yet you rob me, but you ask, how do we rob you? Now, first of all, this is serious stuff. Robbing God? Taking from God what belongs to him. That's what robbing is. If I go to my neighbor and steal, take from him what doesn't belong to me, it belongs to him, I go over and I take that chair on his front porch and I steal it. That's robbing him. And so we rob God when we withhold the 10%. Hey, Ben How, great to see you on, man. Uh, Ben's dad was one of my best friends in Wisconsin. So will a man rob God, yet you rob me, but you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord. It's the only time where we're told to test God. In other words, he's so eager to bless this. He's so eager to honor this. He's like, hey, just, just see if I won't honor this. I know it's a stretch. I know it, man, you go, I got bills to pay. I can't afford to tithe. Oh man, I hear that all the time. Listen, you can't afford not to tithe. <laughs> if you believe God, if you want to be right with God, if you want the blessing of God. So here he says, there, there may be food. Test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I'll not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing you'll not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. 
Our van has 310,000 miles on it, running great. I think that's one of the ways God keeps pests from devouring your crops. Again, this isn't prosperity stuff. It didn't give to get. It didn't give to get blessed. If you give 10%, then you're going to buy, a, you'll be able to drive a Cadillac and you'll get a pay raise every year. That, that's not biblical. At the same time, God does promise to bless. Now, he'll bless in different ways. He'll bless in the positive, giving increase, but here he blesses in preventing the decrease. He will say, I'll, pre I'll prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines of your field will not cast their fruit, says the Lord. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land. People will see a difference. They'll see the blessing. They'll see, man, how did you do that? Uh, so here's the deal. Why is it robbing God? If I give you a $100 bill, and I say, oh, by the way, all I ask is that you return $10 to me. You'd be like, no problem, man. You gave me the 10. Thank you. Here's 10. I go with the 90. In the same way, if we truly believe that all that we have and all that we are is from God, He blessed us. He gave us the, uh, the ability to, to uh, have the job we have. He gave you your brain and your body and the mechanism by which. So all good things come from above, the Bible says. And so if we truly believe that it's been given to us by God, all that we have, all that we are is, for, is by his gracious hand, then returning 10%, no problem, because it's all yours anyway, God. So it really has to do with your mindset. Proverbs chapter 3, it's the book after Psalms. Proverbs chapter 3 speaks to this when it says, and there's so many verses on this, but uh, in the limited time we have, I'll just hit these main ones. Proverbs chapter 3 Verse uh, 9, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. So give God the first fruits. This is why I believe we should tithe from our uh, gross versus our net. But again, that's a different matter. Some people say, well, the net is all I see on my paycheck. And they, you know, they take out taxes, they take out for insurance or retirement or whatever. That's fine. I mean, if they, it, again, I don't think we need to get legalistic or nitpicky about it. But my conviction is, is it all... The, the, it, it, I'm going to give from my first fruits. And so I believe in tithing from gross, not net. That's just my conviction. Then Matthew chapter 23 is where Jesus addresses this. Now, he, Jesus had a golden opportunity here in Matthew 23. If he wanted to say, you know what, that was an Old Testament thing. You don't need to abide by that. We're not under the law. I hear that all the time. Well, we're not under the law. In other words, we don't give to in any way earn points or earn salvation or earn God's love. But there are principles and laws and guidance from God that when we live by, we just are better off. And it honors Him, it glorifies Him when it's done from a pure heart. And here's the key. In Matthew 23, Jesus is making sure that it was done from the heart. They were doing it to uh, kind of pat themselves on the back and, and, and uh, uh, parade their righteousness before others. And uh, Pharisees were all about what others thought of them and announcing it, you know, praying these great eloquent prayers publicly. And He goes, no, it's the heart, it's the heart, it's the heart. And so here he reinforces that. Matthew 23, 23. I want you to see this. So if you have a Bible, turn to it, please. Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth tithe of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. They were tithing even their spices. I mean, that's getting right down to the knit. I mean, that's like not just your, your income, but it'd be like um, something that comes to you unexpected and you tithe that. But you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. So again, God's after the heart. Now here, he had a great opportunity to say, you know what, you don't really need to tie that other stuff. Just focus on justice, mercy, and faithfulness. But he didn't. Look what he says. You should have practiced the latter, justice, mercy, faithfulness, without neglecting the former. Ooh, so he says, keep doing that tithing, even of the very specific stuff. This is, what I, this is the way I interpret it. But make sure it's done from the heart. Make sure it's done with the right reason. And then finally, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, I believe also touches on it in kind of an indirect way. But it says in 1 Corinthians 16, 3 or 2, On the first day of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income. Sounds like a percentage. Set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income. So these four verses, and there's so many others, to me support how important it is that even under the new covenant, even in a relationship with Jesus, we need to practice tithing. Now, a couple questions people always ask. Why is it not talked about more in the New Testament? Well, I think it's because they didn't need to talk about it because in Acts 2, they had given everything. 
If you say give 10%, they say, wait, we've already given 100%. It says they sold all their possessions and gave to those who had need. They were living such a radical life of, of community, caring, love, generosity. They were so sold out to Jesus. They had given everything. So why would you even need to talk about 10%? Then another question people often ask, should it all go to the, your local church? Well, some believe it should, and I practice this. So my personal conviction is yes, but I don't think it's spelled out clearly. And it's based on, the, going back to the Malachi 3, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. And the storehouse at that time was, their, uh, was the local temple from which they ministered to God, to the people, and distributed to help for the needy. Like uh, in our church, our benevolent fund. By the way, the church that I pastor, we started this church, I started this church about eight years ago, and we started the church on tithing. So we as a church tithe, 10% of everything given to our general fund, we distribute to ministries outside of our church and to people outside of our church. We, we give to, uh, benevolence to the poor and the needy. We do local evangelism through that, and we support our missionaries through that. So 10% uh, we tithe because we say, you know what, if we expect God's people to tithe, then we as a church need to model this. And so we do that, and our desire is to increase that above 10% in the years to come. So my personal conviction is yes to the local church, but again, I wouldn't say that is you know, clearly spelled out in Scripture. It's based on the storehouse uh, principle, uh, but I think it's more important that you do this wherever you, you give it. But uh, I think churches would certainly be in a lot better condition today and be able to do a lot more for the kingdom of God if believers practice this. Um, unfortunately, the statistic I've recently heard is Christians give about 4%. Far cry from 10%. Now, another question I'm often asked is, uh, is it okay to kind of work toward that? You know, I, I, I put out all my bills on the table and all my budget, and I just, again, can't afford to do this. Now, I would challenge that. I think you can't afford not to, and when you start doing it, you'll get the blessing of God. But if you truly aren't to the place in your faith, and again, this isn't in a demeaning way, like, oh, you know, you have, well, Jesus did say you have little faith, so that's biblical. But if you're not to the place where you feel like you can do it fully, then yeah, maybe work toward it, but make sure you're truly working toward it and not using this as an excuse. So maybe you look and you're saying, you know, I'm giving about 3% now, but uh, this next year we're going to up that to 5, and then we're going to up that to 7, and then we're going to up that to 10. I would say don't let it go too long without getting to 10, because that's where you want to do, and that's clearly what the word tithing means. And then, again, let this be the floor, not the ceiling. Don't say, oh, we tithe them, we're not going to give any more. Now, you can have a blast with the offerings. Going back to Malachi 3, tithes and offerings. So tithe is 10%, offerings is what you give above that. And uh, Didi and me, we love it when uh, we're able to give above the 10%. And I think in our taxes this year, well, I don't need to say that, but we're, we're well above the 10%. And I don't say that to boast. I just say, man, it's exciting to do what, and I'll end with this, Matthew 6, lay up treasures in heaven versus on earth. He says, do not lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. So this comes back to what I taught about two weeks ago, eternal perspective. This has been a game changer for me. I've got a bunch of athletes coming over tonight for our Thursday night, uh, Theology Thursday. And the, the, one of the athletes who kind of heads this up, he, he always picks a topic, and I love it. And so he said, tonight, he wants to say, what, did you, what do you wish you knew at our age? And, and I'm going to answer it, what do, I, what do I either wish I knew at their age, or I'm glad I did know and have been doing. One of those is time with God, but another is tithing. Because I started this at an early age, and it's just been a part of my practice. And so it's really not, it's not difficult. But man, when you haven't done it and then you start trying to do it, it becomes more difficult for many. And so in Matthew 6, he says, don't lay up treasures on earth. It's just don't, don't invest and put your money and time into stuff that's just going to pass away. It's temporal. It's going to burn one day. It's not going to go beyond anything. It's, it's, you know, maybe you drive a great car and, and all this stuff, but one day it's going to be in a junkyard. Seriously. And it doesn't, again, this doesn't mean it's wrong to drive a nice car. But you better make sure that the Lord has said it's okay to have that. Could you be a better steward in having a less expensive car and more to give? Because so many Christians who say, I can't afford to tithe. Well, look at what you're putting your money into. You got cable TV, you got a smartphone, you've got this, that, and the other, you've got internet. What does that cost you? Do you really need those things? Now, some of those things we do need. But we certainly don't need cable TV. We might need, you know, a phone today to function in our culture. But, but, but believers need to look at their life and look at their budget and look at what they're putting money into. And it's often things that really, if they are honest, it's a want, not a need. And if your wants keep you from doing what God says do, and that's give him the first 10%, then you're 
hindering yourself spiritually. Beloved, don't you want to be a good steward? Don't you want to honor God? If you're a follower of Jesus, you should want to put him first in everything. I'm preaching right now sexual purity at our church. Yes, God should be Lord of our sex life, Lord of our thoughts, Lord of our relationships, Lord of our money, Lord of our possessions, Lord of our priorities. And it's all out of a love for him. It's not legalism. It's not to earn his favor. It's not to get points with God or to impress others. It's because we love Jesus. Jesus gave his all for us. We in turn give our all to him. It's a joy. It's a pleasure. And so instead of laying up treasures on earth, I want to lay up treasures in heaven. So it's like the guy who said, hey, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. Isn't that good? You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. Every time you tithe, every time you give to a gospel, God-honoring church or ministry, that is going to reach souls. That is going to be an investment in eternity. It's laying up treasures for yourself, Randy Alcorn, rewards. We will get rewards in heaven for faithful, godly, heart-inspired obedience to him. God will reward that. We'll do a whole devotion on that coming up. The, the power of rewards. God says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust will not destroy. I get fired up on this stuff because God's word works. Let me tell you something. I've done this. I've seen others do it. I've seen the blessing of God in doing it. And again, you don't give to get but God blesses. He promises to pour out blessings when we obey Him. And it's so exciting when you do God's Word, even when it's hard, even when it's a stretch, even when it, it is a step of faith to do this. But when we do it, God blesses. God honors it. And we can know that we're right with Him in that area of our life. Let's pray. God, we thank You for Your Word. I'm so glad that you address things so practical as our finances, our money, our possessions, because that's the kind of stuff we deal with every day. So praise you, Lord, that you love us so much, that you give us your word. And oh, God, I'm, I just treasure your word. I love your word. I love your spirit, God. And I love your principles, because when we follow them, there's such a joy and a, and a, and a blessing that comes. So I would pray, God, especially those that are listening that are struggling, they're already convicted because they're not doing this. They're not even close to this. Some maybe just aren't even close to 10%. They're not giving diddly squat. Would you just gently convict them, but do it in a way that motivates them to, to say, you know what, I'm going to start doing this for the glory of God. And I can't wait to hear some of the stories. I actually have a whole file of tithing testimonies, and it increases uh, regularly because you are so faithful to bless us in this area. So I pray that for those, especially those struggling today. Those that are doing this, just encourage them and help them go further. Those that aren't doing it, convict them in a way that leads to repentance, that leads to refreshment uh, as they obey you and trust you and see your hand work in their life. In Jesus' name, amen. See you tomorrow.